essentially every... Case of the you know a Benjamin Button kind of case where you you were born old and then you start getting younger as you grow old. It's a weird to say, but everybody grows up, everybody grows old, and that's so true in the physical sense of things. Uh, but it's not always true in the spiritual sense of things. It's not always true psychologically, emotionally. It's not always true financially, even. It's not always true um, professionally. Uh, there are some people that are continuously, for years and years and years, dealing with the same problems, the same difficulties, the same hardships, the same challenges. And what happens is we are stuck in a rut. It's like we're spinning our wheels and we're dealing with the same drama. We're dealing with the same problems. We're being betrayed by the same people. And, uh, you know, uh, people are, are betraying our trust the same way. And, and sometimes those things happen in cycles, right? Those things happen in cycles. I don't know if it happens with you, but like every, uh, I don't know, every certain month of the year you get sick, right? I don't know, does that happen with anybody else? For me, sometimes... Uh, yeah, for me in May, for some reason close to my birthday, I almost always get like a, a bad strep throat or something like that and I get like real sick. We get into cycles, but it's, it's cycles of, of lack of productivity, cycles of, of, of stagnation, right? Do you know what stagnation is? When something is stagnated, something is just stuck. It's just sitting there. And what happens is, I don't mean to be the, the physics teacher here, but there is a thing Newton called inertia. And inertia is, is essentially it states, you can take notes if you'd like, this is science class. Uh, inertia is, in, 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 essentially states that objects uh, in motion tend to stay in motion and objects in rest tend to stay at rest unless there is an outside force that is breaking that inertia, okay? And, and that's why, for example, if we had a giant brick here today and you laid the brick on my stomach and Gabe, who mentions that he admires me so much, comes with a hammer and just whacks that brick, I am almost not gonna feel anything. The brick is just gonna break because all of the force being exerted towards the brick is just breaking the inertia, right? It's just, it, and it doesn't really move it. That's why it doesn't hurt me. It's different because of the mass of the brick, right? It's different from if you take this towel and you lay it on me and then Gabe comes with a hammer, I'm definitely gonna feel it. Why is it? Because there's just not so much mass and you don't need a whole lot of force to break the inertia. Do you follow me? Does that sound, do you, do you follow me? You guys look a little confused. So because there's not a lot of mass, um, breaking inertia to this little towel is fairly easy. All you need is a flick and it breaks the inertia. But if you've got something that's heavy, you know, a brick or even something heavier, a car even, if you flick a car, it's not gonna move because you need so much more force to be exerted into it in order to break the inertia of the car. Right? So why am I giving you this long-winded science lesson and you are almost falling asleep? Because a lot of us in different areas of our lives, we have so much inertia built up. We have, uh, uh, we have been stuck and, and we feel like nothing is moving forward. We feel like, like uh, whether it's in one area or another, some of us are less fortunate that it's happening all over the place, right? You get home and things are the same with your parents or things are the same with your husband or things are the same with your wife or things are the same with your kids. And it's been like that for two, three, five, seven, ten 10 years and nothing has changed. You've been making the same, uh, uh, the same, I don't know, $30,000 a year now for five years and nothing seems to move forward. You've, 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 you've been driving the same car for 17 years now and nothing seems to move forward. Uh, you, you've, you've, you, 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 just, you, you just don't see a way out. You just don't see a way to break inertia. And that's, that's what this series is all about. It's about breaking inertia. It's about, it's about 
uh, um, finding out what patterns in your life need to change in order for you to apply those principles and begin to see some practical growth in your life. Do you know why? Because everybody grows at some point physically, but emotionally, intellectually, psychologically, especially spiritually, we need to have a part, we need to play a part, play a role into breaking that inertia because the devil does not want you to move forward, but God has created you for you to move forward, for you to grow in life, for you to grow professionally, for you to grow psychologically, grow emotionally, grow especially spiritually so that you can acquire more knowledge of God and live your life to the fullest, to the fullest. And that's what God intended for you. Can anybody say amen to that? All right, so God wants you to live your life to the fullest. So uh, uh, to my text, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, uh, uh, we read from this passage yesterday, uh, not yesterday, but last week, uh, and, um, and I'm going to go back into it today, and there are a few principles that I want to go over with you, um, and I'll remind you quickly of what we spoke about last week, and then we'll go right into it. Is anybody with me today? All right, three people. I'm excited about three people. Is anybody else with me today? Amen. All right, a little more, maybe seven or eight people. Is anybody else with me today? Amen. All right, there we go. Now, now we're awake. All right, maybe you didn't have your coffee, and I get it because I did not have mine, and I am crying out for a cup of coffee. Oh, my God. Just the thought of coffee just makes me mm, salivate. All right, God, so, guys, I'm reading out of the American Standard Version. And it says, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I felt as a child, I thought as a child. Now that I became a man, I have put away childish things. For now, we see in a mirror darkly, but then face to face. Now, I know in part, but then I know fully, even as I am also fully known. But now abideth faith, hope, love, these three. And the greatest of these is love. So, Father, thank you for your word. Uh, bless it today and open up our hearts for what you want to talk to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, last week, we started talking about this, this passage um, and showing a, a, a dichotomy, right? I don't know if, if you don't know what dichotomy is. Showing... Um, um, showing, uh, uh, there, there is, let me put it another way. There is a tension in the text, right? There's a tension. There's something that on the surface doesn't seem to agree. On the surface, it doesn't seem to make sense. And what that is, is Paul is saying that I used to be a child. And back then when I was a child, I used to speak like a child. I felt like a child. I thought as a child, but now I became a man. So those childish things have been put away. And what he is saying is we need to eventually put away childish things. Uh, and so, Pastor Diego, I get that. Where is the tension? The tension is back in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus is teaching over the people. And the Bible says that some kids come around uh, and the disciples try to, to, to get the kids away from Jesus. And Jesus says to the disciples, don't do that. I want the kids to come because theirs is the kingdom of God. In other words, for you to, for you to uh, um, claim the kingdom of God over your life, you need to be like a child. And the, the, the tension is right there where Jesus says, we must be like a child. Uh, and Paul says, I need to put away childish things. That's the tension in the text. Uh, so, so what is it? Should I be like a child or should I put away childish things? And the fact of the matter is that both are true. Pastor Diego, I see you didn't have your coffee today because you're not making any sense. So what... What Paul is saying, what Jesus says, they don't contradict each other. The fact of the matter is that Jesus is talking about the matters of the heart. Jesus is saying, be like a child, but Paul is saying, don't behave like a child. You can have the heart of a child, not, but not be childish. And that is the, the theme of our talk today, is be childlike, but not childish. How do I become childlike, but putting away childish 
things. And, and that's essentially what it is. And last week we spoke about five different things that uh, a, a person who has a heart like a child, a heart as a child, uh, um, uh, five things that these people do and why is it that we need to do them, why we need to practice them. And they're very important. If you weren't here last week, I encourage you to go to YouTube and watch it there uh, and you can get it there. But uh, um, uh, essentially, there are two more things I want to share with you about being like a child because it has to do with the heart. Can you say that with me? Say, it has to do with the heart. What happens is sometimes we are so, uh, we are so grown, you know, uh, uh, and I put that in air quotes because, um, where are my notes? Here we go. All right, so uh, we, we are so grown, and I put that in air quotes, because uh, we, we, are, we are so cynical about everything, right? We're so cynical about everything. And one thing that a child does that we must learn to do, and our hearts must be geared that way, is to believe with no reservation. To believe with no reservation. The other day, I was changing Noah. Noah has a little changing station in his room. And for those of you who don't know Noah, Noah is the single most handsome little boy in the face of the world. He is absolutely gorgeous. He is absolutely gorgeous. And if you don't believe me, just wait around. He is coming and he, he will, I'll, you'll see. He is just amazing. Uh, and it's just um, a coincidence, the fact that he is my son. Um, but he is amazing, right? So I was changing Noah, and then he gets up, and uh, 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 I taught him how to do this little thing when we count to three, and then I pick him up, and I kind of do a little airplane thing with him, and that's all fun and games. But this time, when I went to grab him to do, you know, one, two, three, and then fly around with him, he was like, no, 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 Dad, don't, don't touch, don't touch, no, 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 no. And then I, I was like, okay, what do you want to do? And then he's like, He's like, uh, 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 he's, we're teaching him Portuguese. So he's like, no, go away, go away. I'm like, go away? Who do you think you are, kid? And he's like, no, 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 no. Just like what he was trying to say is step back a little bit. So I stepped back a little bit, but I was like, you know, what are you going to do? And then all of a sudden he just jumped. And I had to catch him in midair, right? So he was like, you know, get away a little bit. And he just wanted some space because he wanted a thrill to jump. And he was so free jumping out of that changing, the changing station is about, I don't know, it, it's about just, just upwards of waist high. And for a kid who's two and a half years old, it's, it would be a tragic fall, right? Uh, so he just jumped out, and I was, I was like, you're crazy. And then the Holy Spirit just spoke to my heart, that's how my mind works. He, the Holy Spirit just spoke to my heart and said, I wish you would trust me like that. I wish you would believe in me with no reservation. I wish you would just leap out in faith. I wish you would just take a step. Oh, come on, somebody. I'm preaching and you don't even know it. I, I, I wish you would leap out in faith. I wish you would jump out into nothing, trusting that I would be there to catch you in midair. You know, and that's one thing, that's a matter of the heart. For us, we're so cynical. As we grow old, we become cynical. And as we grow old, we become suspicious. And as we grow old, we just start questioning everything. And as we grow old, all we want to do is why? Why do I have to get up? Why do I have to take the trash out? Why do I have to go to work? Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to do that? Why do I have to go to school? We want reasons for everything. And if those reasons don't satisfy our cynical nature we're not willing to get up we're not willing to move we're not willing to break inertia and the fact of the matter is that God does not always tell you why sometimes you just have to trust him sometimes you just have to step out in faith sometimes you just have to open your mouth and share sometimes you just have to do it because he says you need to do it because we need to trust him do you know why he knows just a little bit more than you do. Amen. Come on, can anybody give me any help here today? Can anybody help me here today? 
All right, he knows just a little bit more than you do. Oh, I know you were born in 1984, the year of our Lord in 1984. He was born in never. That's right. Bible says he is the Prince of Peace. He is, oh my God, he, he is, uh, the Bible says he is uh, um, um, the first and the last. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He was there when there is nothing, and he will be there when he puts, a, he puts an end to everything. Do you know one thing? Look at this. This is amazing, right? Moses was chosen by God, and the Bible says that God called him. Uh, um, and, and I'm not going to go into the whole story, but uh, all I want to say is this. Moses was questioning God. Because Moses was far away from Egypt. He didn't want to be bothered. He had his family. He was, he, his life was set. And then God all of a sudden just calls him and says, Moses, you know, sometimes God doesn't speak that nicely. You know, Moses! And Moses was startled. And the Bible says that Moses came near to, to what he was seeing, which was a bush that was burning. Uh, but the bush itself was not being consumed. And the Bible says that the voice of God was speaking out of that. And Moses came close and God t told him, Moses, I want you to do something for me. And then Moses started giving God excuses. Oh, but I can't do this, I can't do that. And God said, don't you get it? Just, just trust, just take a leap. Trust. I got you. Turn to your neighbor and says, he got you. That's right, that's right, he got you. He, he, he's got you by his hands, he's got you. And, and God tells Moses and says, I, I got you, I got you. And then Moses says, okay, okay, okay. Let's say I do go. Who do I tell them that sent me? When I get there, I'm going to say I was sent, and they're going to ask me, who sent you? What am I going to say? Do you have a name? And then God says, I am that I am. That's a weird name, right? Well, that's God's name. I am that I am. That's so profound because he never was. He never will be. He just is. <laughs> you know that little emoji with the head exploding? Yeah, that's me right now. He just is. He never was, he never will be, he just is. Yesterday, he is. Why is it? Because yesterday, for us, you can't reach into yesterday. God is above it. God is above it. You can't reach into tomorrow. God is already there because he is. He, oh my God, come on. He is next week. Come on, can anybody clap to that? Come on, somebody. Right? And that's why we must trust them because sometimes we want to know why and we don't realize that the reason that would convince us doesn't really matter. You know, I like to think of it this way. Our view, our view is just horizontal, right? How I look at you right here, horizontally. We just see like that, like we're driving, we see the road horizontally. God sees kind of like the GPS, like vertically, right, from the top down. And what happens, just like when you're driving, the GPS knows, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm, you know, I'm driving down the road and the GPS says, um, um, you know, this is an alternate route for you because there's heavy traffic up ahead. And I look at the road, I don't see traffic. And I'm thinking to myself, this GPS does not know what he's talking about. There's nothing over there. If I don't trust the GPS, the GPS sees what I can't see. Because the GPS is looking from the top down. You follow me? All right? I'm just looking horizontally. The GPS is looking from the top down. And from the top down, there is an amplitude to this vision that it goes far beyond what my eyes can grasp. And that's the same thing with life and God. 
You see your life horizontally. You can only see what you got planned for tomorrow, for next week. God sees what's going on 10 years ahead of time. And if God tells you, if God, and, and I know God has brought you here today to hear this word because he knows what's going on in your life or he knows what's about to happen in your life and God knows you need this word to survive what's coming and whenever you face a hardship and you think you're not moving forward, you can think back to this bold, weird looking guy and think, he said God knew and God knows about it. God is empowering you to overcome to overcome. God wants you to grow the heart of a child that believes with no reservation. Believes with no reservation. Come on, somebody. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. All right. Now, Paul, we've, we've spoken about being like a child. Now, why do we have to avoid being childish? Right? Why do, I, why do we have to avoid being childish? And one thing that's very important is that we must understand is the value of process. Value of process. And one thing that's very childish is a lack of patience. Right? Lack of patience. You know, and that's, that's, a, that's maybe a characteristic of a little bit of all of us. Lack of patience, because a child lives in the now. A child lives in the now. The other day, I was, I'm already trying to teach Noah um, you know, f- principles of, of financial management. <laughs> I know. He's two and a half. But what can I say? I'm an accountant. I can't help it. So, you know those kinder surprise little chocolate things? He is completely in love with those. And um, what I was trying to teach him is the value of waiting. At waiting pays off, right? Waiting pays off. Patience pays off. And uh, that's the underlining lesson I'm trying to teach him. So I just show him a kinder egg, and he just, his eyes just light up. He goes crazy for the little kinder surprise egg. And he just comes after me and whatever I ask of him, if I, he never wants to give me a hug in public. If I have a Kinder Surprise egg in my hand, he will just throw himself at me, right? So I show the Kinder Surprise egg and he's like, he's like, oh, give it, daddy, give it, give it, daddy. I'm like, hold on a second, hold on. Because you think he's not listening to you, he doesn't understand you. They understand every word, every word right? Every word. If you tell them to stop and they're not stopping, they're not stopping, not because they're not understanding you. They're not stopping because they're testing their limits. All right. Believe me. So he's looking at me like desperately wanting the kinder surprise egg. And I tell him, all right, son, daddy can give you this now, or you can wait you can wait a little bit, and Daddy will give you this one too. So he sees the second Kinder Surprise egg. He goes crazy. He's like, oh my God, I want it, Dad, I want it! Ah! So I'm like, you choose. Do you want this one now? If you want this one now, Daddy will eat this one. Or do you want to wait a little bit And then daddy will give you both of them. Do you know what he said to me? He said to me, he said, da un papa. He said, give me one daddy. He said, I'll take the one. He said, I'll I'll take the one. Forget the other one. I'll take the one. And that's a very childish characteristic is not being able to wait. Not being able to wait. And that's a big thing. Why is it? Because life is a process. Growth is a process. And the fact of the matter is that if you're not willing to be patient for the process to take place, you are not going to live the growth that God has prepared for you. Right? You're not going to go to college and uh, right off the bat get a $500,000 a year, uh, $500,000 a year job. It's a process. 
You may get out of college and have to be an intern for a little bit. You may have to get an entry level position. You may, if you're starting your business, you're not going to have 400% profit the first year. You may have to manage your finances in such a way that you can just manage to pay your bills the first year. It's a process. How many of you understand it's a process? Yeah, the, the, your first year of marriage is not going to be all rose petals. You're going to have some difficulties. You're going to have some time adjusting, but it's a process. If you're patient enough, if you're patient enough, things will, will, will eventually fit together if you're patient enough. Right? Just because you're here maybe for the first time or it's your very first month coming to church ever and it's the first time you hear about God, it doesn't mean next week you're going to be a God expert. It doesn't mean that everything is going to entirely make sense to you right away. You, you have to trust the process. You have to, you, you, you've, got to, you've got to be patient. You've got, to, you've got to be patient. And in order for there to be growth, you need to be patient and you need consistency. Say consistency. You need to be consistent. Like, for example, you can't go to the gym today and expect to have a six-pack tomorrow. I've tried it. Ain't going to happen. Not going to happen. It doesn't happen. Why is it? It's a process. You need to be patient and you need persistency. You need to keep at it. You need to keep going. Oh, but it hurts. But that's when it's working. You know, that's that good kind of pain. You know, the day after you go, to the, you go to the gym for the very first time and you feel like Rambo. You feel like, 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 like um, maybe this is date myself, but you feel like Jean-Claude Van Damme in the, the little white dragon uh, blood fight, the blood fight movie. Like, and you're just lifting those weights and you feel like you're, you feel like it. And then the next morning you get up and you're like, oh my God. Oh my God. Don't think. Thinking hurts. Right? And believe me, some of these personal trainers, they'll make you hate your life with one dumbbell. They'll make you regret ever being born with a dumbbell in 15 minutes. You need to be patient and you need to be consistent. That's how growth happens. And the same thing happens spiritually. Same thing happens spiritually. And God set up a system, set up a, a, a structure in place in order for us to be able to grow. Look at this, Ephesians chapter 4. Put it up uh, on the screen for me, uh, Vinny, if you could. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Look at this. If you're taking notes, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Look at this. And he gave, he being God, he gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. For the perfecting of the saints unto the work of ministering, unto the building up of the body of Christ. Just a second, Vinny. The building up of the body of Christ. So Paul is talking about growing as a body. And he is saying, you know, these things that we have, apostles, prophets, uh, evangelists, pastors, teachers, these aren't things made up by men. This is a process. It's a structure that God set in motion to help you grow. And if you want to grow in the knowledge of God, and if you want to grow in consistency, you need to submit yourself to this process. And you need consistency. That's why it's so important to come to church. Oh, but isn't God everywhere? God is absolutely everywhere. But if I seek God in my bedroom, will I, will I feel his presence? You will. If, you, if, if, if I pray to him in the privacy of, I don't know, my closet, is, is he going to show himself true to me? He is. He is going to reveal yourself to him. But in order for you to grow, you need consistency. You need to submit yourself to the process. You know, a lot of people think that salvation is the end of what God wanted to do with you. Like God did everything. Jesus came uh, uh, um, and died for you on the cross. And on the third day, he rose and went back to heaven only to save you. Salvation is absolutely amazing. But salvation is not the end game. Salvation is the door of entrance. Salvation is just the beginning of the story. If you're willing to seek for it and search for it, there's so much to grow beyond knowing who Jesus is. And there's so much to find out. There's so much to discover. There's so much to experience that you will be completely awestruck to know the great and wonderful things God has prepared for you. If you're only willing to try and take that leap of faith and trust that he will catch you in midair, God wants to reveal so much more to you if you would only 
Submit yourself to the process. There's so much more. Salvation is not the end game. Salvation is just the entry point. Salvation is the beginning. Can you imagine that? And we, what we think is, oh, I'm saved. Now that I'm saved, now all I got to do is cross my arms and wait to die so I go to heaven. That's not it. Salvation is just the start of things. After you're saved, my God, that's when it begins. That's when knowing God gets interesting. That's when knowing God gets exciting. And that's why we have these bunch of people here that have been through everything else in life, that have, been, that have experienced every kind of drug, that have been to every kind of party, that has had any, every kind of friend, and that has been everywhere around the world, and to just to come to this place and realize that there is nothing and there is no one that can feed my soul like Jesus can. Can you clap your hands, somebody? My God. Woo. Can you turn to your neighbor and tell him salvation is, the, is just the, the, the beginning? We must trust the process. Look at this, verse 13. Come on, Vinny. Verse 13. Till we all attain unto the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a full-grown man. Paul is talking about growing up. Onto the measure of the statue of the stature of the fullness of Christ for 14, that we may be no longer, that we may be no longer children. We don't want to be children anymore. Our hearts must be like a child. I must believe like a child does. I must be joyful like a child is, but I can't be complaining like a child complains. Right? Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men in, in craftiness after the wiles of error 15. But by speaking truth in love, we may grow up. Say, grow up. Grow up. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, grow up for Christ's sake. Come on, tell him, grow up for Christ's sake. Come on, grow up, grow up, grow up. It's not basically what I'm trying to tell you, my brother, my sister, what I'm trying to tell you today is you got to be sick of facing the same problems and the same issues all over again. You have got to be sick. You have got to be tired of going through the same kind of routine and the same kind of patterns and the same destructive behavior. There has got to come to a point where you say, I got to grow up and I got to experience and live the best that God has. As for me, that's what God wants for you. Come on, somebody. Grow up. Grow up in just a few things. Is that what it says? No, no, no. Grow up in all things into him who is the head, even Christ, 16. From whom all the body fitly framed and knit together through that which every joint supplieth according to the working in due measure of each several part maketh the increase of the body, the building up of itself in love. Essentially what he's saying, don't get distracted by all the THs after the words that are completely unnecessary. Just think of this. Essentially we grow up in Christ, so that we can be more like Christ. That's what Paul is saying. We must trust the process. And then with Paul, the end game here, Paul is, is saying, I need to grow up, back to my original passage, Paul says, I need to grow up so that I don't speak like a child anymore, so that I don't feel like a child anymore, and so that I don't think like a child anymore. Say three things. How many things? Three. three things. Three things. Three things that will give you away every time. I can sit with you for five minutes and know whether or not you're childish. All I got to do is pay attention to what your speech pattern is to what your feelings reveal and to what your thoughts are. What Paul is saying is, before, when I was a child, 
I spoke like a child, I felt like a child, and I thought like a child, but now that I am a man, now that I'm grown, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm grown. I'm grown. That's right, say, I'm grown. I'm grown. I'm grown. I, met, I met Gabriel. He was this little, oh my God. And believe it or not, you look at him today, he used to be cute. He used to be adorable. And every time I remind myself of that, I just get fearful for Noah. Oh. He is so adorable. <laughs> I, I, have, I have pictures of Gabe. I don't know. How old are you now? 16. 16. So I probably met you when you were four. Yeah. yeah. He was like four. And... The other day I was giving him a ride and I looked at his face and he's got a beard. <laughs> when did that happen? I looked at him the other day. Did you get that tattooed on your face? What happened to you? Say, I'm grown. Yeah, I'm grown. Paul says, now that I'm a man, i got to put away childish things. Say, put away. put away. The first thing I learned is that it's not an outside force that's going to help you do away with the things you need to do away with. Paul said, now that I'm a man, I have put away childish things. I need to make a decision. And remember, there are three, three things that define you as either childish or as, as a person that is spiritually grown, right? Which is your speech patterns, your feelings, and your thoughts. Three things that Paul says. I used to speak like a child, I used to feel like a child, and I used to think like a child, but now I'm grown. And I have put away childish things. In other words, if you don't put those things away, they're never going to go away. If you don't put away certain speech patterns, those things are never going to go away. If you don't start controlling your feelings, those feelings are never going to go away. If you don't... if, if if you don't change your mind about the thoughts that control your life and your decision-making skills, you're, those things are never going to go away. You must make an active decision. You need to make a stand and say, from this day forward, I will, I will, nobody's going to put them away from me. I will put away these childish things. We must put them away. And it's, and it's three things Paul talks about, and that's what I want to close with. Paul first speaks about the speech. Say speak. speak. Say speak. 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 What have you been speaking about? What are your speech patterns? I'm not, I'm not saying whether you stutter or not. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is what, what comes out of your mouth about yourself? What comes out of your mouth about your family? What comes out of your mouth about your business? What comes out of your mouth about your, your education? What comes out of your mouth about your career? What comes out of your mouth about your relationship with God? What is, what is your speech pattern? Pastor Diego, why is that so important? Because in Proverbs, if you're taking notes, it's Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. Can you put it up on the screen for me, uh, Vinny, please? Proverbs 18, 21. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. What the writer of Proverbs is saying, which is King Solomon, he says, there is so much power in your mouth. There's so much power. There's the power to build things up. There's the power to tear things down. Do you know what a rumor can start? in somebody else's heart? Come on, somebody. If you have ever, ever been to a high school in your life, you will know. You know, sometimes when somebody gets close to you, going through a tough time, and they're experiencing a moment of difficulty, a moment of fragility, 
you know, a, a, a moment with their person, that person needs a word of encouragement. If you're not careful with what comes out of your mouth, if your speech pattern is compromised, if your speech pattern has childish characteristics to it, instead of taking the opportunity to build that person up and make that person stronger, you will, you will finish that person and tear them, tear them down, tear them apart. You know, I've, I've, I used to. I don't play video games anymore, not because I wouldn't play. I would love to play. I just don't really have uh, a, a lot of time for it. Um, but, you know, holidays or vacation, I like to play video games. I love to play video games. And there's a video game I've always liked. Don't judge me. I know I'm a pastor, but what can I say? I love Mo Mortal Kombat. Oh, my God. More, you would not be able to beat me in a Super Nintendo Entertainment System Mortal Kombat if I was either Scorpion or Sub-Zero. You would not be able to get close. Touch me! No, you wouldn't. I was that good. I was good. I knew every fatality, every brutality. I knew every, every, every little combination and two forward, two backward, one down, B, A, and I knew all of those things. Oh, I, was, I was the master. Yeah. And there's one, one moment, which is my favorite part of the game, is when your opponent is like, and then there's that nice narrator that comes in and says, finish him. Right? Did you get the goosebumps? I get it all the time. Finish him. Right? And then, the guys, the, the, I forget who did it, but somebody uh, Patrick Chung and somebody else did it in the Patriots game last week. Uh, after a sack, right? After a sack, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, forget it. Ah, forget it. You know, after a sack, the guy was like this. And, and I think it was P Patrick Chung did a celebration, like, you know, and kicked him and he fell backwards. It was a cool moment. All right, back to church, back to God. You know, when the guy is like, finish him. Some people get to you in life and they're just like that. I'm, I'm dead serious. Look at this. You know, some people come to you on when you least expect it. Wednesday afternoon, 4.15 in the afternoon, and you are stressed out of your mind. Midweek, you're trying to get over hump day, and, and, and somebody gets to you and says, oh, man, I'm so stressed. You know, everything I've ever tried is just going backwards, and I can't, I can't figure out life. Um, and then that person is just there. You know, and, and the devil is in the background just saying, finish him. Finish him. And all you got to say is, see, I told you so. You always make bad decisions. And you blah, 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 blah. And you're never going to get it right. And you never this. And you never that. You never hear me. And, you blah, blah, blah. and the person is just so vulnerable. And depending on what your speech patterns is, or speech patterns are, depending on what they are, you will really finish that person off. And if, if, you, if you are able to concentrate on what God is doing in your life, you will find out how much power is in your mouth to build other people up. And, and, and when the person comes at you and, oh my God, I am giving up. I'm giving up. Just this week, this week, somebody called me, desperately calling me. I said, Pastor, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. My nephew has, has just sent me a video and saying goodbye to the family, asking us to take care of his mom because he's going to commit suicide. You think this is funny. It's life and death. The guy is there. And I watched the video. His eyes are lifeless. Looking at the video, the guy is crying. 30-year-old man. Fully bearded, successful, got a job, living life like nothing is wrong. And all of a sudden, he's just, I can't do it anymore. Please take care of my mom. I'm sorry, guys, to disappoint you. What's, what's coming out of your mouth at that point?
power of life and death. And if you're wondering, we did get there in time. And when somebody got to his house, he had a, a sheet wrapped all around his neck, and we were able to help him down. I don't know what's going to happen to him. My prayer is that his heart will be open to the message of the gospel and he will find out the wonderful things that God has prepared for his life. We're working on it. But it only can happen if, if, if you be careful with your speech patterns. There is, there is life or death in the tip of your tongue. You choose which one you want to dish out. And believe me, it's not just about other people's life. It's about your own life as well. What have you been saying about your own future? Are you the kind of person that always curses your, your day when you get up in the morning? I'm not a morning person either, right? But I don't have to get up in the morning and say, Ah, oh, hell. Yeah. Oh my God, pastor just said hell. In church! And we wonder why the day is so crappy. You get out of bed in the morning and you just prophesy disasters all over your day. We're talking about practical growth. I'm, I want to talk about real practical things. And don't worry, I'm already over time. I'm not going to go through all three things. We're going to get back to it next week. But pay attention to this, the speech patterns. What have you been talking about? What have you been declaring? And what I want to teach you today, very practically, I want to teach you today that what you declare has power. Let me say it again. What you declare has power. What have you been confessing about your life? What have you been declaring? What have you been proclaiming about your life? You know, when you get your paycheck and, you know, it's, I don't know, $318.63. And you look at it and you're like, oh my God, I worked like 5,000 hours this week and it's only like 18. Right? Like, oh my God, I worked double shifts and, ah. And only this, this little bit of money and you start cursing your paycheck before you put it in the bank. And you think to yourself, oh, I'm not going to be able to do anything with this. I'm not going to be able to do anything with this. I instead of releasing curses upon your money, in instead of releasing curses upon your day, in instead of releasing curses upon your business, instead of releasing curses upon your parents, Instead of releasing curses upon your, your spouse. Instead of releasing curses upon your children. Instead of releasing curses upon your friends. Why wouldn't you release a blessing? And instead of saying, what am I, what can I do with $318.63? I can't pay anything. This is just, this is just, this is just crap. Ah, Pastor Diego said, crap. I did. Get over it. What am I going to do with all, what am I going to do with this little bit of money? Instead of saying that, just say, God, thank you. Thank you. Because I know that this little bit of money in your hands, believe me, Jesus fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. What can he do with $318.63? Is it weird I remember the exact amount, is it? Yeah. Maybe a little bit. What have you, what have you, have you been releasing? You know, uh, um, I, I, I'm not saying, right? Hear me out. I, I'm almost done. I'll be done when I get done. I'm not saying that we need to be those creepy Christians that you're burning up with 103 degree fever and you're saying you're fine, right? I'm serious. You know, there, 
there are people that like, oh, my head hurts. Don't, don't say your head hurts. Declare you're healed. Those people are just weird. I, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying, I'm not saying uh, um, deny what you're going through. That's not what I'm saying. You need to recognize that you're going through a tough time. Your head, does your head hurt? Your head hurts. What can I do? You don't need to deny that your head hurts. But there is, there is, there is, there is, a, uh, there is a fact. The fact is your head hurts. That's a fact. But there is a truth that is beyond that fact. And that truth is by his stripes we are healed. So you can declare the truth over your life without denying the fact. Because if, if you believe it, God will act upon your life and eventually that truth will overtake the fact. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. All right, it's like this. It's like this. We have gravity. How many of you, of you know that gravity exists? You don't? You don't believe? Pastor Yig, I don't believe you. Gravity does not exist. Really? It does. Gravity exists, right? Gravity exists. Gravity is true. You can't see it. You can't touch it. Gravity exists, right? Gravity exists, right? That's a law, the law of gravity. But there is a different law, which is called a higher law. Say higher law. Higher. Gravity is fact, but there is a higher truth there's a higher law that can overtake gravity. And that law is the law of aerodynamics. It's the law of aerodynamics. If you design a wing in just the perfect angle, and if you set it 88 miles an hour, for those of you who are Back to the Future fans, <laughs> nerd alert, right? I like that to probably my favorite trilogy movies, but don't judge me. If you set it in just the perfect speed, in the right angle, what happens is those wings, they propel a huge airplane to beat gravity. And I ask you one thing. We're very close to Logan Airport. Every time you see an airplane flying down, when you see that airplane, do you think that airplane denies gravity? Does it negate gravity? No, gravity still exists. There's just a higher law. Come on, somebody. There's a higher law. That's the same thing with God. The reality you're living right now, you don't need to deny it. You just need to declare the higher truth that God has placed over your life. And you can claim that without being weird. Don't be weird. You don't have to deny you have a headache. Just declare a blessing over your life. And say, I do have a headache. But I also know that by his stripes I am healed. It's a very practical exercise today and, and, and throughout this week's small groups. How many of you know that there's small groups this week? There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Small groups this week. So throughout the small groups this week, we're going to talk about, in a very practical way, how we can change our speech patterns, how we can change our speech patterns in order to live the blessings of God in, in our lives. What are... What are childish speech patterns? And what are mature speech patterns? I want to challenge you this week. Every time you get the urge to complain about something in your life, instead of complaining, catch yourself. And you have to be active about it. Put away childish things. And instead of complaining... Start to declare the higher truth of God over your life. When, 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 you're, when, you're, when your child or when your spouse or when your friend is getting on your nerve, instead of cursing them out, 
and saying, there's, there's no way I can continue to, <laughs> continue to go through this. Instead of, instead of complaining about them and instead of declaring, declaring negative things over their lives, instead of finishing him, Instead, declare a blessing. Ask God for wisdom. Ask God for the ability to forgive. Start declaring blessings over your life. And you will see, believe me, this happens. You will see eventually, if you trust the process, you will see eventually that the things that have been tearing you down, the things that have been dragging you down and weighing you down, you will begin to see those things building you up. Oh my God, if you believe that, you would have clapped your hands about that. Those things will start building you up. God wants you to put away childish speech patterns. Be careful. Like the wise man said, be careful, little mouth, what you speak. Right? Be careful. Be careful. There's the power of life and death in your tongue. The question is, which one of those are you going to experience? There are a lot of people that are living a life that is truly lifeless, with no purpose, no realized dreams, and unrealized potential simply because everything that comes out of their mouth is purely death. And if you're just willing to be challenged on that, and if you're willing to catch yourself, put away childish things and start declaring life over every situation around your life, every situation around you, you will see that God will build you up. Can you stand to your feet and clap your hands with me? Before I close in prayer, I want to give you the opportunity to make a decision for Christ today. Maybe you're here and uh, you've, maybe you've been coming to church for, for months or years and I don't know your background, I don't know your story. And I... I, I Ask that every, everybody in, in the building just, just uh, stay connected to the throne of God right now. This is a very important moment. I know we're a little bit over time, but I don't want to finish today without giving the opportunity to make a decision and take a step forward to serving Jesus. You know, maybe you, you hear this, this message, message today, and it's a very light message. It's, it's meant to kind of bring you towards a reflection of what you are going through in life. And you realize that you have been kind of spinning your wheels. You have been in a rut. And you have not experienced truly abundant life. And you want to change your ways. You want to begin to put away those childish things. And you want to live your life to the fullest. You want to live everything God has prepared for you. And this invitation I'm giving right now, salvation, it's not... The end game for God, it's just the beginning. If you want to experience truly what God has for you, open up your heart and let the Spirit of God touch you in a way that maybe you don't understand right now. But if you give room, He will do wonderful things in and through your life. So my invitation to you today is, if you're not sure that if you die today, you go to heaven, if you're not sure of that, and you want to know a little bit more of God, your Savior, the Lord Jesus that came to die for you and rose on the third day, if you want to know more about God and if you want to open your heart to Him, every eye in the building closed, please. I ask you that you lift your right hand uh, for me and I want to pray for you. God bless 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 you. Come on, we have seven people today. Can you clap your hands for that? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. 
So everybody that lifted their hands, and even if you didn't, the whole church, I just want the whole church to pray uh, in support of those who are opening their hearts to Jesus at this time. And just repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, I accept you in my life. I open up my heart to what you have for me. Come and change me. Change my ways. And help me grow to be the man or woman that you created me to be. Write my name in the book of life. I want to find out who you are and who you created me to be. In the name of Jesus, forgive my sins. I am yours. Amen and amen. Wonderful.